It's just one of those days where you wake up thinking that if you jazzed up Stravinsky's Owl and the Pussycat, it'd be awesome. I mean, the original seems like the kind of thing that wouldn't get stuck in your head, because it's a 12-tone row that usually goes something like this. Wait, Stravinsky's stuff is copyrighted? Come on, Congress. Alright, well, since copyright law promotes cheap imitation, we'll just have to write our own version called the Fowl and the Pussy Bat. Pussy Bat? How about Laser Bat? Laser Bat? Oh, uh, now foul sounds lame. How about bowl? But we all know it's a bird bowl. Okay, so the rule of a 12-tone row is that you have to use all 12 chromatic pitches in some order, and you go through them one by one. But you can add some creativity by choosing the note lengths, what octave it's in, you can add rests and repeat the current note, you can even switch back and forth between two adjacent notes in the row. You just can't go back to the note two pitches earlier, at least until you go all the way through and repeat. And since I'd rather put my actual composing efforts into things that aren't copyright skirting imitations of Stravinsky, I picked a 12-tone row at random. I mean, who's gonna know the difference? Oh, and let's pick another row to be the piano part. Alright, here we go. Exactly catchy, but not like Stravinsky is either. Silly Stravinsky. Sorry, I don't want to make fun of Stravinsky, but I have to for extra protection against copyright lawsuits because while it's illegal to show you his work in a flattering manner, here in the United States of America we have the constitutional right to make fun of people. Also, he was a horse-faced fascist. Anyway, all we have to do is jazz this up a little, following the same 12-tone rules in the vocal embellishments too, but maybe invent a jazzier non-12-tone piano part, and then you get something more like this. The bow and the laser bat went to town on a lovely bird umber segue. They took hot pockets and plenty of sprockets wrapped up in a tasty entree. The bow looked up to Orion above and sang out of key. What a nice laser bat you be, you be. See, that almost made sense. I mean, as a melody, not the words. Anyway, if you're me, it's catchy enough to be stuck in your head, and now you're wondering if you can 12-tonize other actual nursery rhyme song things. Because Stravinsky was totally imagining mothers singing 12-tone music while rocking their babies to sleep, helping their little baby minds break free of the tyranny of tonality. Yeah, sorry Stravinsky, probably not a lot of that going on out there, but with the jazzy version, I could see it happening. And once you take away the piano part, the two versions have exactly the same notes, which are pure 12-tone music. All that changes is the imagined context of those notes, which no one else can hear anyway. It's like when you're on the train on a Friday night and a group of people suddenly start loudly singing some pop song you've never heard. In their heads they hear the chords, the backup vocals, the story and emotions, everything that makes what they're singing make sense. For them it's this epic moment of real connection, but they forgot that to the people on the train not imagining that context along with them, they're just noise. Kind of like when people talk about a sport you don't follow or a TV show you don't watch and fail to realize that it's not that what they're saying isn't interesting so much as that it is literally meaningless to you. And of course, that sort of unnoticed imaginary context surrounds everything you ever hear or see or do ever, especially the things you know best, especially your own work. Anyway, let's try 12 tonizing something else, like Mary Had a Little Lamb. Please tell me Mary Had a Little Lamb isn't copyrighted. Ah, good. Published 1830. And apparently based on a true story. Huh. The real Mary's house was destroyed by an arsonist in 2007. So it's about time someone made this tune a little darker. All we have to do is take a three-note tune and turn it into a 12-note one. Mary had a... Hmm, can't 
can't go back up here. How about we make it minor? Little lamb. But now we can't go back to here. Okay, so switch these. Now it's Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, lit. I could go little lamb, but I think I'll save this note or we'll get lost later and instead go up here. Little lamb, then go back down here and grab some of these. And then we'll finally do this one. And then we'll finish with these guys. But the last note needs to resolve, needs to make sense. So on the repeat, I'll emphasize this fifth. I'm pretty sure this will work. Our brains are used to connecting certain patterns of notes into single objects because of the physics of sound waves and the tonal language we've built off it. I know your brain will hear these three separate notes as being one chord. Notes next to each other are connected by proximity, and if you can hold on to one while you leap somewhere else and then go back to its neighbor, you can connect over the gap. And here again, this is a big leap, and if we had to do it blind, it would be hard to find the right note. But we just heard this one, so it provides an anchor in the space. Then the last note connects to the first in a nice happy physics approved fifth. And this is how we'll connect notes into words and words into a complete sentence in a tonal language you understand. Oh, which reminds me, one more improvement. And here we go. Mary had a laser bat, laser bat, laser bat. Mary had a whose eyes exterminated and everywhere that Mary went Mary went Mary went everywhere that Mary went her bat echolocated Anyway, what's interesting about 20th century 12-tone composers is that they were actually trying to get away from the implied context and invisible meaning people were so used to. Stravinsky would be decomposing in his grave if he heard that I'd tried to make the owl and the pussycat, I mean, the bull and the laser bat, sound all normal, when the whole structure of the 12-tone row is designed to help break free of old musical habits. How are you supposed to hear the pure truth of the notes A flat, F, D flat, when existing music has taught your brain to hear it as a Neapolitan chord in the key of C? Unhearing the chord in the notes is as difficult as unhearing the words in the sounds I'm making with my voice. But Stravinsky didn't want children growing up learning that music was supposed to sound a certain way. He knew that whatever language people use to speak to children is the language they grow up to speak and think in. It's kind of like if a group of people realize that all they ever do is talk about celebrity gossip, and they want to stop, but they don't know what else to talk about. So they take the sentence, her new hairstyle is simply ridiculous, and replace every word with a random word that's the same part of speech to get, her entangled pet is offhandedly beloved. Those words are completely random and thus inherently meaningless, but hey, the notion of an entangled pet being offhandedly beloved has so much potential meaning. Whereas the well-defined cliché is forever trapped in its own shallowness. I'm reminded of Ulipo. They're a French literary group well known for using awesome constraints to create experimental work, like writing an entire book that doesn't contain the letter E. At one point, they played with a rule where you take a known text and replace all the nouns with a noun seven places later in the dictionary. You'll get resumes that are grammatically correct but unconventional. People in every creative field think about this sometimes. How do you break free from convention? How do you get your brain to stop following the same well-worn neural pathways and think something you haven't thought before? And one answer is strict rules, and following those rules even when it isn't easy. Music, grammar, math, how to behave in social situations, and how to live life in general, it's basically all made up, and while having rules in common is useful and makes it easier to communicate, if they're not working for you, you can make up new ones and see what happens. Okay, now let's try Twinkle Twinkle Little Star. How do we choose 12 points in space to connect into a recognizable constellation? Let's see, so in the key of C it starts C, C, G, G, A, A, G. Good so far. Then F, F, E, E, D, D. Huh, can't go back to C. Can't go home, can't be tonal. That's exactly the point of the constraint. In fact, we've already used up all the notes we'd need for the rest of the usual Twinkle Twinkle Little Star and none of these Sharpie Flatty ones. So we'd better redo this to get more of those in sooner. Try to grab the weird ones while we're in the neighborhood. Also, as long as we're updating the music to the 20th century, we might as well update the lyrics too. Twinkle, twinkle, little star, I don't wonder what you are. You're a giant ball of 
the gas so you can just kiss my face yes you're an exploding mass of hydrogen in outer space science Obviously, I've been fighting against the intent of the 12-tone rules. This variation really isn't more chromatic than Mozart's, but using the 12-tone system made this a pretty straightforward and angst-free process. I mean, there's only so many possible combinations of 12 notes. It's like solving a puzzle rather than dealing with the overwhelming possibilities of infinite space while crippled by the responsibility of free choice. It reminds me of looking up at the stars at night. Not the overwhelming possibility of infinite space part, or um, the twinkle twinkle part, but the part where you take the randomness that is the eternally separate stars and connect them into shapes your brain can hold on to. There's no melody in this collection of pitches, no more than there's an Orion in the sky. It makes me wonder what other meaningless things we pretend have meaning by sticking them into patterns with context. I mean, that's not a dude, that's a harsh vacuum of empty space punctuated with giant balls of nuclear explosion times. But then I wonder if a proton plus an electron making a hydrogen atom or a huge pile of nuclearly fusing hydrogen making a star is any more real than these stars making Orion. I mean, is it an atom or does it just look like an atom? Constellations and Rorschach tests tell us that it takes nothing for us to make sensible patterns out of randomness, and all it takes is a tiny nudge, like a name, or well-placed googly eyes, and suddenly we all interpret something random as the same non-random thing, whether it be arranging stars into constellations or random events into superstitions. It doesn't take much in music, either, to go from random notes to shared hallucination. And like a Rorschach test, different tiny nudges give vastly different interpretations of what's 99% identical. So don't worry about how we only have 12 factorial 12 tone rows. We'll manage to muddle through our limited existence somehow. I actually quite like Three Blind Mice, though I feel it's fallen out of favor recently because of the tail chopping part. I assume the farmer's wife chopped off their tails because she missed, not out of cruelty, but perhaps today's children should be sheltered from the fact that until someone invents cheap, efficient, mouse relocating robots running on cheap, renewable energy, it's pretty likely they're gonna have to kill a mouse someday. Actually, someone should totally get on that, because the same robots could also take care of spiders and bugs. And birds. Birds don't want to be in your house, but sometimes they find themselves there by accident, and then they just freak out. Anyway, back to how there's 12 factorial possible 12 tone rows. That's it. And fewer if you want them to be fundamentally different, like some rows are just transpositions of other rows, or the same row backwards or upside down, or both. Even in other types of music, any piece is just one possible combination of notes, just as every book is just one possible combination of words. Makes me think about the author's role in creating a work, and question how much their intention matters when they're just choosing a possibility that could have been chosen at random. I imagine an author going on a treasure hunt through the books in Borges' Library of Babel, an author who can instantly call up any of the 31,488,000 factorial books, one for each possible combination of the characters in a book 410 pages long. The author holds the first draft, a book of all blank spaces, and then throws it away and grabs one that contains just the first word. On and on like this, eventually rereading the book and revising it by throwing it away and grabbing one that fixes a spelling error, or holding two books that are the same except for one word and trying to decide between them. Finally, after sorting through mere millions out of the universe-dwarfing number of books in the library, the author is done, holding a dusty old volume that has always existed, but that no one else has ever paid any attention to, and says, Hey everyone, I found a good one! 
On its own, the book has no more meaning than the others around it, but the author found that it connected well with the shapes in their head, and since we aren't so very different, thinks you'll see basically the same constellations, even if some of the details are different. Really, creative people are just skilled at navigating an exponential tree of possibilities. Without a lot of practice, you'll be stuck slowly walking up and down just a small number of familiar branches, making artistic decisions based on what's right in front of you. But with enough experience, you know the general structure. You know what would happen if you went a few branches down any path, all at once, without having to actually go there. So you can instantly leap down to interesting destinations that you'd never find if you were going step by step and turned back when the going got rough. Creativity means fearlessly embracing things that seem odd, even random, knowing that if you keep your brain open, you'll eventually find the connections. Gonna go ahead and play some Schoenberg now, since he's the one who came up with this 12-tone thing. Wait, Schoenberg is copyrighted? Schoenberg? He was born in 1874. Holy bird bowl, I just want to show people the first known example of an entirely new musical paradigm, and by new I mean a hundred years old, but if a century of cultural progress is difficult to access, no wonder most people don't already know about these things. Oh, I'm so angry. Use your anger. Use it in your art. Okay, bird bowl, let me just play you this avant-garde piano piece inspired by copyright law. Wow, you're right, Bird Bowl. Copyright law encourages innovation after all. Encore. One blind mouse, one blind mouse, has expensive lawyers and lobbyists who take advantage of a Congress that perfectly represents its people but being apathetic to everything that doesn't personally affect them and seem content to let one company's greed single-handedly destroy our culture, as if all innovation and progress doesn't build on prior work. But hey, maybe humans are just born smarter now than we were thousands of years ago. Anyway, I'm programming my mouse relocating robot not to recognize your existence, greed-blinded little rat. I'm gonna go ahead and improvise some cheap imitation Schoenberg, since I gotta protect Schoenberg's intellectual property rights by keeping his work in obscurity. I mean, if he came back as a zombie and was like, By heart, why did you let people hear my music? That wasn't very nice. I would feel so guilty. Also, if zombie Schoenberg ever comes to get me, I've got my strategy down. He had such severe triskaidekaphobia that he would literally worry himself sick over 13-ish things and ended up dying on Friday, July 13th, 1951. So I just count slowly to 13 and then stop. Maybe make as if I'm about to say 14 and then change my mind. What, zombie Schoenberg, you gonna eat me before I get to 14? No. Didn't think so. Anyway, this isn't even 12 tone, I'm just doing stuff. But it's more than just thoughtlessly hitting random keys. You could easily tell the difference between this and true randomness, which means there's some sort of human-created order here, even if it's not the usual human-created order. I mean, you could make fun of this for sounding like a two-year-old banging haphazardly on a piano, but nothing makes you appreciate Schoenberg like banging haphazardly on a piano and then listening to his music. His work has more order, is more musical, yet even less tonal than what I'm improvising now. And to be fair, I could also improvise something superficially nice like this just as easily. In fact, even more easily, because this is so cliche and I'm just signifying the shape you already know without trying to say anything myself, and this is simple, meaningless blather that's worse to me than random notes and I feel gross playing it, so I'm gonna go back to playing with new shapes, new shapes, do 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 shapes! People make fun of how people are afraid of anything different and just want recombinations of familiar things, but I don't think it's a bad thing to want stuff to make sense and to have meaning. Without context, meaning does not exist. If you want to communicate something specific and know that it's going to be interpreted exactly as you mean it, you have to use shapes people know, which is why any movie or story which has the goal of evoking a specific emotion is doomed to be either cliché or largely misunderstood. Of course, too much cliché, and all that's communicated is the intent to communicate a certain thing, not the thing itself. A lot of truly innovative work makes use of familiar tropes or old folk songs, and it's not because a creator couldn't come up with anything new, but because a little bit of recognizable structure gives people a scaffold on which to build their understanding of the parts that matter. Doing great work isn't all about innovating on every single detail. There's plenty of old ideas worth doing right. But imagine you're Stravinsky and you've worked relentlessly studying and creating and exploring everything that's been done, and you've gotten to the point where everything sounds cliché and you're wondering how to go further. And then you take another look at what that crazy Schoenberg guy has been doing. Now you're listening to it not in the context of musical form as you know it, but in the context of the very idea of musical form itself. Suddenly Schoenberg doesn't seem so crazy anymore, and you're like, yes! New ships! 
Hopefully you, with the context of this video, will also find a place in your brain for Schoenberg and his crazy shapes. But how crazy this sounds shows us just how much we take for granted in music. Listen to what's still normal here. Of course, there's rhythm, meter, the play between lines, the little stories happening all over the place. But even if you play random pitches with no rhythm or form, they're still pitches. There's still a pianist sitting at a piano playing piano notes at a pretty normal rate for a pretty normal amount of time. It took until the second half of the 20th century until composers started to test the limits of what music is. John Cage, a student of Schoenberg's, is known for questioning the form of music altogether, like that a string quartet should sit around vibrating their bows against their instruments rather than smashing them with hammers, shampooing their hair, and playing the radio, or that they should play anything at all, as in his famous work 433, where performers come out on the stage and then sit in silence for 4 minutes and 33 seconds. I'd play you an excerpt, but silence won't be in the public domain until 2062. Anyway, structure is a beautiful thing. We understand the world and each other through the patterns we know, but it's also important to realize the structure is there. Realize how invented it all is. That frees you to build new, more beautiful structures that communicate things there were no words for before. Even if that new word might not be understood. It might be hard to hear 12-tone music as beautiful, but it's not even about trying to hear it as beautiful. It's about simply trying to hear it to hear it as it is, to for one moment in your life relax and stop grasping for your usual patterns, to let sound be sound and listen to it as sound. No preconceptions, no expectations, just sound. Mary had a little lamb, little lamb, little lamb. Mary had a little lamb whose fleece was white as snow. And everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, Mary went. Yes, every, everywhere that Mary went, Mary went, her lamb was sure to go. Then someone burned down Mary's house, Mary's house, Mary's house. Someone burned down Mary's house, but she was dead. So what happens now? How can art possibly keep going forward when it's already succeeded in breaking the boundaries between what is art and what isn't? I mean, here I am playing with 12-tone music, which is so 100 years ago. Then again, this piece of art isn't music. But I'm confident humans will keep creating their own boundaries, so we'll always have plenty to break. After all, being art isn't a property of a thing, but in how we perceive that thing. Just as no noun is really fundamental to any particular collection of atoms, so I don't know why people obsess over the question what is art, when questions like what is a table and what is a tree are just as difficult to answer, and, and neither art, trees, nor tables really exist. Kind of. I mean, sometimes I'm pretty sure that all the objects and truths we see in the world, from bird bowls to quantum electrodynamics, are just patterns we see out of randomness, because we are literally blind to anything that doesn't fit into a recognizable pattern, and that most of the universe is the kind of chaos too chaotic to be noticed and named. Anyway, it's not about these words. They're just here for a little bit of structure, context, to let you know there's a person here who thinks about these sorts of things. This has no meaning except the meaning you make, and that's what matters. I mean, no pressure or anything, but you're responsible for your own thoughts and reactions, so I'm not going to end this video by telling you what it's really all about, as if telling you what something's about changes what it is. And yet it does, doesn't it? 
Either way, I'll be over here making shapes with these 12 tones. I like shapes. Check it out. So singing to you is dissolved. 